So our next uh, discussion will be a panel uh, led by Teresa Lunt. The, the panel session, Roadmap to the Future, Clouds, Pervasive Computing, and M2M, Machine to Machine. Uh, Teresa is the Vice President and Director of the Computing Science Laboratory at Park. Uh, she has a, a number of responsibilities in that function, including uh, leading research efforts around content-centric networking, uh, ubiquitous computing, security privacy, ad hoc networking, and a host of other topics. Um, she will be uh, introducing her panel in just a moment. Um, little known fact about Teresa, uh, Teresa was an early adopter of uh, not only digital photography, but the ability to take that digital, digital image and find a way to put that into the physical medium, uh, actually printing digital images. So, uh, Teresa and panelists, welcome. Thank you all for joining me and welcoming to the stage our panelists. Thank you, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me introduce the panel and the panelists. We'll be discussing the roadmap uh, for the applications of the Internet of Things, including uh, not only uh, the visions and the opportunities uh, for what it will be enabled, but also what that means for the infrastructure and for business models and, um, and what the risks and challenges are. Um, we'll, we'll be... Um, oh, thank you. Okay. So we'll be hearing first uh, well, for, I will be speaking for a few minutes first and telling you a bit about what we're doing at PARC. Um, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, and then uh, we'll be hearing from Hiro Kishimoto, who is head of system software laboratories here and of Fujitsu Laboratories. And um, he's chair of the Distributed Management Task Force and, and of the Japan Marketing Subcommittee. And he's vice chair of the GRID Consortium in Japan. He leads the cloud computing research in Fujitsu Laboratories, and he created the cloud fusion concept, which powers the cloud technology that, uh, that Fujitsu offers in the big data business areas. Uh, he's received multiple awards. He's uh, part of the Open Grid Foundation leadership, and he's received the IEEE Gordon Bell Award. And welcome to the panel. We'll also be hearing uh, from Wayne Ward. Wayne is Vice President uh, for the M2M Group for Sprint Nextel. And he uh, was named to this position in October 2009 with responsibility for developing M2M and connected vehicle solutions. This M2M Group utilizes the network systems and open device expertise of Sprint Nextel and its partners to deliver integrated product applications to the business and consumer markets. And he also um, is involved in developing solutions for usage-based insurance, retail, smart grid, asset tracking, and security. Welcome to the panel, Wayne. Thank you. And then we'll be hearing from Tom Aldridge, who's Director for Energy and Sustainability Lab for Intel Labs Europe. He's been with Intel since 1995 and has been in many roles at Intel, including developing the Itanium server architecture and leading several advanced power technology and product pathfinding and research teams. And in his current role, he's involved in the um, Internet of Things and pervasive computing areas. He's also, in the past, been part of a high-performance computing startup. And he brings uh, d diverse, he has a diverse background, including supercomputing, system technology development, and power supply design. Um, Tom, welcome to the panel. Thank you. OK, so for this panel, uh, we will be spending up to 10 minutes for each of us to talk a little bit about our work and then um, we'll be, um, I'll be asking the panelists some questions and then we'll have some time for you all to address uh, your questions to the panel. So let's get started with, the, um, with my presentation. So at PARC, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with PARC. We are a, a, a research center, but we are also our business, and, and we invest in new technologies that we think will be disruptive and game-changing in the next five to ten years. Uh, and then we partner with other companies because we don't directly um, produce products or services, but we partner with companies to commercialize those technologies. And I'll be telling you about uh, some of those in the ambient intelligence area. We call it contextual intelligence. And we see uh, contextual intelligence as an important driver for, uh, f for services innovation that really harness big data. Um, so uh, to harness context, our vision is really uh, about uh, 
sensing the and, rec and, and recording information about all of the actions that people take during their day and using that context uh, to, uh, as a foundation for, for new applications and services. For example, the context may be sensed by uh, sensors in the environment or sensors that you wear or that you carry on your devices, or it may be um, information, the content that you consume, uh, information about that content. Um, it may be stated preferences or tags, explicit information, uh, preferences and information um, interest that, that you've expressed. So the context can come from many places, but the important thing about it is that it's interrelated. So it, it connects people to information, to other people, to, to uh, tasks and activities and so forth, so that um, it can, it's, a, it's a rich fabric uh, that allows uh, many uh, diverse applications to be built on it. And, and we build uh, user models uh, from this information um, and, and one example um, of a user model is, this doesn't seem to be advancing. <laughs> well, I will talk anyway. So um, <laughs> We're going to need to get that working yes. somehow, right? Yeah, so one example Where's of a user server? model uh, that we've... It just went. Oh, it's, okay. Uh, we've developed on a research project for the U.S. government is uh, personality profiling. So um, we've been able to, from text messages, email, corpus, for example, uh, even very short messages, harness information that we can use to predict the personality traits of uh, the, peop the, the authors of those uh, messages. Um, and it's, it takes an amazingly small number of messages to get around 80% accuracy on the number of personality traits. And this chart in this slide that you can see is showing uh, f for the uh, trait of extroversion, extroverted uh, type of personality. And this is just one of many kinds of user models that you can build when you start collecting the, uh, this contextual information and that could be used in new kinds of applications. And let's see if this works. Good. Um, uh, and, we, and we've built a platform to uh, basically um, harness the context, help, help build a variety of user models for different types of applications. And, um, and then we use, and this is showing that um, those, you can, you can um, get information from a number of different models of a single user's behavior to rank alternatives in some sensed uh, situation. So typically we want to sense the um, activity or infer the task or activity or intent or goal of the user and then um, develop a bunch of alternatives, either providing information or taking action and rank them using the user models to um, help us estimate the utility to that user of any of those uh, alternative actions that we might take or information we might provide. Um, I'll just briefly show you the diversity of um, projects that we've engaged in the last, just last year, year or two, and that's been, um, you know, taking advantage of uh, contextual intelligence. Um, one is we call digital nurse assistant, where we can reduce the amount of time that nurses spend on tasks like finding people, finding equipment, and filling in forms so that they can spend more time on patient care. And that's really done through understanding what their information needs are at the moment and what their collaboration needs. So uh, if, since every user that we model has a personal semantic web or context, uh, if you share those uh, contexts with others in your work group, you can then uh, enable collaboration more easily so th that you don't have to be exchanging information by writing down stuff in forms, for example. Um, we've done quite a bit of work in, in fraud, waste, and abuse, where we model uh, users and, and, um, uh, and healthcare providers and, uh, and so forth, and have discovered in a number of different domains of, uh, of business new types of um, bad behavior, fraudulent behavior we've, uh, we've been able to discover through the use of these technologies. We've, we're also providing new types of services to police, 
uh, and law enforcement act and, and in parking for uh, parking enforcement officers we've helped them coordinate with each other and and um, get more work done and, and more revenue for their cities and sentiment analysis and topic detection is something that we that we use in in many of these applications and also in, in uh, customer intelligence and emerging event detection like political events for example um, and we also are doing work in call centers to do to um, understand the conversation and what uh, is working and what was isn't working and we can mine those transcripts and and, uh, and learn uh, and detect problems as they occur in real time um, we're also doing some work in transportation services we're uh, working now with a, with one large city on the east coast and we're going to expect to uh, work in other um, cities on, with their public trans transport systems to build uh, contextual systems to deliver offers from local vendors to riders on the on these um, transport systems and so that's ongoing work and we're also uh, just recently finished a small project um, for an automotive company where we built some personalized services for the car so a personalized assistant in the car uh, who understands your calendar, understands your situation, are you going to be late because of traffic, who needs to be notified, could possibly read to you related materials um, that you received as read-aheads for, for your meetings and so forth. Also can um, notify you of emails, texts and, and other messages from important con contacts that may be relevant to, to your upcoming activities. So those are some of the kinds of things that we're doing at PARC. Um, I'd like to hear from you, from you, Kishimoto-san, about your work. Thank you. Okay. So my name is Hiro Kishimoto. I'm the head of. Uh, system software laboratory. I'm in charge of cloud computing research in Fujitsu. The, as Kimura-san and Bob mentioned in their keynote, human-centric and intelligent society is the Fujitsu's vision of computer computing in future. Cloud computing is, has been changed from the uh, uh, computer-centric of mainframe in very early days to the uh, network-centric uh, based on our uh, systems of uh, client servers um, to, but the, uh, recently we have uh, ability to access to the knowledge through sensors, cloud, and smart devices. It is imagining the computing into the human-centric. Human-centric concept is connecting people, uh, technology connecting people the way, and the, uh, there is a huge amount of emerging data, uh, and the, uh, we are collecting all these data by sensors, and the analyzing their time using the computing power of digital world in the cloud. And the uh, new, new knowledge uh, born in this process is very valuable for us to help our decisions. This is our uh, ambient uh, intelligence. So distributed data analysis applications and other applications is using cloud for their uh, scalable, on-demand, self-service platforms. With these great attribute, the cloud helping the applications to run smoothly in a platform. However, recent distributed applications is using to handling the smartphones or sensors need not only resources within data centers, but they need network resources and also the, man the mobile device management services as well. Unfortunately, at this moment, 
network or services cannot have cloud attribute. So this is why we need extended cloud to support such new applications handling sensors or mobile devices. Extended cloud providing all necessary resources to the applications. We have very good, very fast network within data centers. Also, many offices and homes have a, uh, fiber optic lines. It provides you very good latency and bandwidth. But the machine to machine network is very different. Huge number of sensors defines very defined latency and the uh, bandwidth requirement. Also, sensor is very small and low cost. So its processing capability is limited and memory size is also limited. Also, many of the sensors has not enough electric power supplies. So keep the electric consumption very small. Sensor is not always on. Besides these restrictions, sensors may handle, gather very sensitive data, private data, for example, medical data from your bodies. So sensor network, M2M network, is very different from traditional network we already know. So we have to extend or create a new way to use or manage M2M networks. Cloud computing in a data center is very centralized computing uh, paradigm. But the, when the M2M networks become popular, we have to go back to the distributed computing uh, paradigm again. And in, in, to support to get the uh, advanced use of the information, we have to uh, build a platform it can optimize on network-wide basis. And it can be achieved by combining the technologies of networks, computing, and mobiles. And based on the concept of software-defined networks. So next generation platform can be, uh, be a distributed uh, application uh, network-wide distributed computing. And this platform gives a uh, bone uh, ambient intelligence for our uh, context. Thank Thanks you. very much. And I pass it to you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, thanks for having me here. I'm Tom Aldridge. I'm the Director of Energy and Sustainability Labs for Intel Labs Europe. I live in Olympia, Washington, so I travel a lot. Um, we, we've got groups in California, Washington, Oregon, and, uh, um, and Ireland, and, and England, so it's, uh, it's a very uh, distributed organization. It's, um, it's really my pleasure to lead this organization. We were formed with the express purpose of taking our knowledge of energy efficiency outside of the walls of the platform, outside of the chip, outside of the server, and seeing what we could do to invent uh, how to use uh, information and communications technology uh, uh, to make the world a more sustainable, more energy efficient place. Uh, a fairly audacious uh, statement, but it's uh, for the last five years what has been guiding us. Uh, uh, we, uh, you know, we took some baby steps for the first couple of years and now I think we're doing, we're doing quite well. And so today I'm going to just talk about a few excerpts from the slide set I brought and, uh, and show you some of the things we've been doing. 
So we like to talk about becoming an electric society, really becoming a society that's empowered uh, to use energy more effectively uh, through the application of, of data sciences, whether it's information-centric networking or, or uh, cloud computing or, or the various Internet of Things uh, technologies and, and, and concepts that are coming out. What we'd, what we'd like to do is, to, is you know, uh, recognize the megatrends that are out there, the migration to cities. I think you've all seen the data that says the growth of the megacity is, is, is pretty much unstoppable right now. Uh, we're, we're going to have cities above 20 million emerging all over the planet. Um, we, we also have to have the availability of services for uh, folks, whether they're in the cities or, or outside the cities, providing the services that support those cities. Um, the density of trade opportunities, uh, especially in a, um, uh, a data economy, uh, uh, exponentially multiply when we start packing uh, so many people together into the cities and realizing that we have to manage the activities, the transportation, uh, the services, the resources. And then, of course, there's the, the impacts, the clean air impacts, the scarcity of water, scarcity of, of energy uh, impacts that have to be mitigated. And so, you know, the question is, what path do we take, take to get there? Uh, certainly, one uh, industrial research lab isn't going to solve that, but we like to think that, you know, that we're helping uh, do a small by by applying our technologies towards you know some of the areas that you see here the ubiquitous data economy um, how do we establish combustion free zones and manage that in within a city core um, how do we how do we manage zero uh, zero energy or net positive uh, energy buildings um, and and the list goes on uh, so you know this right now for our five-year plan we're being driven toward these two major vectors becoming an electric society and the emergence of, of the megacities. So our, our research as, as it says on the slide here is, is taking a fresh look at how we can use technology uh, to do this. Um, we're investigating a wide range of opportunities all the way from the citizen uh, to, to the buildings that they're in to the environment that they live in. And we're focusing on creating a platform, uh, much like uh, you know, cellular telephony became very successful once a platform was defined. The classic example is the is the PC, um, which you know when 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 it broke out of being custom computing to platform-based computing, uh, uh, the economy uh, around that platform became very rich, and the innovation that was able to, to happen flourished because there was a, uh, an ecosystem based on a platform. So we're focusing our research on creating an ambient intelligence platform. I was glad to hear the words already spoken. <laughs> um, uh, and, and when we talk about ambient intelligence platform, we're talking about, we're talking about all of the interfaces, all of, all of the, the, um, uh, the rules and, and, and the uh, uh, as uh, uh, the plumbing being well defined to create this ecosystem. Uh, this is a huge eye chart, so I won't spend much time on it. Um, this is our, 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 our quadrant of what we're doing in the cities, but we're basically viewing the city as a platform. And we're working currently in London with uh, Imperial College and University College London. We've established a, uh, a research institute there. It's been up and running for about a year. Uh, we also have uh, a similar program going on with Trinity College in Dublin, and we work and we work with Pecan Street and Portland, uh, Pecan Street in Austin, Texas, and uh, Portland, Oregon, on on city topics. So let me just take a minute and talk about our ambient intelligence platform vision. And it's you know everyone who's going to put this up today probably says the same thing in, in, in about the same way, which is we've, we've got the opportunity here to define a, a well-structured platform all the way from the sensors, the sensing electronics themselves, all the way up through the services layer and then back to the end user. And, and it's very important to note that, you know, while, while we can draw a stack diagram, um, and just like every other computer architect can draw, um, uh, that for us, 
user user centric uh, design, um, meeting the needs of the user, interpreting those needs, and and creating the appropriate technologies for the users uh, in the various classes of use for this platform is what's going to make it either succeed or fail. Whether we do a good job at that or not is is going to be our measure of success. Um, also underlying this is the idea of data security, uh, machine trust, um, and, and uh, uh, we're weaving that in across all layers of the ambient intelligence platform definition. Uh, I'll, I'll put a plug in here for Dr. Eve Schuler, who works in my group here in, in, uh, uh, in Santa Clara. Uh, Eve has been pursuing trusted personal cloud research on this. And, and moving into the realm of how do we assign attributes to the lowest possible level devices so that those devices can be seen as trusted, trustworthy, or, or not. And, and we're building up from that level. Uh, and that's led us into the ICN discussion, the CCN discussion as well. So. Mm -hmm. So we've got all these domains up here and, and, and basically what we're looking at with AIP is how do we do resource optimization? And, and you, may, you may ask, well, what is Intel's interest in this? Well, in, Intel, uh, you know, several years ago started talking about continuum computing. Our interest is obviously in, in top to bottom of the stack where our current silicon resides, everywhere from Atom to Xeon and in between, and possibly where new, new silicon might reside. Maybe we, uh, you know, maybe we would come out with something at the low end uh, because we need to show how to fill a hole in this platform down at, down at an aggregator level or a sensor level. Uh, so we're working on these, these topics in the lab. But then on top of that is the new Intel, the Intel that, that is now looking at services. And so uh, not only um, are we looking at, at the silicon and the hardware now, but in the lab we're looking at analytics we're looking at how those analytics uh, drive services models and, and how they can be applied in, in both the edge and the big data cloud. I'd just like to spend a few minutes talking about one of our projects uh, which we call, uh, and it's come out of the AIP program, it's called the Personal Office Energy Manager. This has now become a product, so it's gone from research to retail over the past four years. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, it's, it's basically a tool that allows uh, a, an office worker to understand uh, their consumption of, of energy and resources in the office um, and also be able to give critical feedback to the building management systems or to the building managers on how they feel um, and, and you know, how they want to compete um, uh, in, in maybe a gaming scenario. And we've, you know, we've, we've got the, the, arch the basic architecture that ties uh, um, everything from the sensors all the way out to building management systems. We've, we've had to work on, you know, on a, on a uh, 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 metadata structure that can tie in uh, uh, multiplicity of sensor types, sensors that we don't understand yet. Uh, and, and then back end that with uh, a more traditional uh, uh, data structure, an SQL database that, for example, a building management system might, might use. So it's been, a, it's been a pretty cool program that has taken the researchers from, you know, just, just pure, you know, pure thought, pure research on this project, all the way to working with people like Johnson Controls, who they never would work with, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's been a lot of fun. And I've got a little video that talks about it. Uh, so if we can cue that up. POEM is a new user experience for socially responsible office workers. It saves energy and increases office worker comfort by engaging individuals in managing their personal footprint of energy and paper consumption, while also connecting them to the building manager for HVAC and lighting control. The user interface is an attractive garden of flowers, if you will, a graphical metaphor of total energy consumption in specific major categories of energy such as PCs, printers, and other plug loads. At a glance, users can holistically see results of the state of their consumption patterns or drill down into specific categories. 
With a double click, users can see their personal computer energy consumption and compare against the average consumption of others in their department, their floor, or their building, seeing their daily results over the past week. And specific goals for energy consumption can easily be set with a drag and drop set target bar. If consumption exceeds target levels, flowers in the garden start to wither and wilt. Each flower relates to a specific category, PC, printer, plug loads. Users can also check ambient conditions of temperature, humidity, and light levels at their desktop and compare it to external building conditions. They can also provide comfort level feedback to central building managers, telling them they feel cold or hot. Helpful tips and notifications are suggested to users based upon the user's energy targets and analyzing usage patterns. POEM also provides soft switch screen controls so the user can actuate lights, fans, heaters, or other plug loads all from their desktop. Pilot tested in Japan and France, POEM has proven a measurable impact in energy reduction and lasting end user engagement. A management console centrally collects and reports status and results from the population of POEM users using a McAfee EPO compatible set of charts and reports to track occupant comfort levels and aggregate their power and usage. With POEM, managers know where their energy goes by computer, printer, or plug load. Twenty-six different reporting tools are made available, all in a McAfee EPO plug-and-play framework. Reports help trend over time energy consumption by building, floor, department, and specific use. Future versions of POEM have been prototyped to track these consumption trends by location to pinpoint the zone for ambient conditions and mobile user feedback. Okay, I think I think I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up. I've probably gone over time. Um, I just I just want to say that the 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 big the big frontier that we see in all of this is maintaining maintaining secure and trusted data as we develop our technologies, and um, you know that that is a major thrust of our lab uh, right now, and it will be as we go forward. And I'd certainly like to invite dialogue and collaboration. You know, on this uh, there's. Uh, 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 we can certainly think of all the threats that are out there when we have all these machine-to-machine -machine networks and uh, unless we start from the architectural layer and, and build up with data ownership and, and machine trust in mind, um, I, I don't think that we're going to succeed. So. And then I'll, uh, whoops. Thanks. Um, I think we had a really great um, overview of the day here from, from the uh, network requirements to the equipment requirements, the data center requirements to the uh, applications and services and the intelligence that kind of pulls everything together. And uh, thanks uh, for, your, for your really insightful remarks. Um, so it strikes me that everybody's positioning themselves, you know, all of these companies, the carriers, the equipment providers, everyone is positioning themselves to uh, s deliver these services and to own, own uh, the data, right? So uh, there's going to be some kind of a shakeout, I guess, about who owns which part of this um, new information economy. But, um, you know, I wanted to ask you, Wayne, about how are the networks, how do you see the networks evolving to be able to accommodate this new traffic? And is it going to make this um, problem of congestion at the edge of the network worse or better? Right. Um, well, that's, that's a great question. And how is this traffic going to be supported? How is this tonnage going to be delivered? Um, and it sort of plays right into to our own strategy. Of course, each carrier has their own way of going about it. Um, but with Sprint, we feel pretty strongly that um, not one network satisfies all needs. I mean, you have the bill of materials cost with the radio modules, you have the cost of transport on the technology. Um, things like LTE is really great if you're doing video surveillance, but it's an absolute overkill if you're trying to just basically deploy a remote door lock on a uh, secured panel, right? Uh, the business model doesn't fly. Um, so if you want to, uh, for example, the garage door application, you know, if you try to engineer that solution and sell it to a consumer, it's going to be more than the price of a plasma screen TV and they're probably, the market's not going to bear that. 
So we feel pretty strongly that the Internet of Things or machine to machine is all about supporting multiple technologies and that's the architecture we put in place with Network Vision so that um, we have a long runway and a long um, um, longevity of the network for 2G to support machine to machine, for 3G to support our, our, our base of customers in machine to machine and LTE. So being able to apply and use the right network technology on the application allows you to really parse that data across three different types of network technologies and satisfy the actual bandwidth and throughput needs on a per application basis than trying to um, force feed circles into squares based on the latest and greatest technology. Great, thanks. Maybe Kishimoto-san, you can also give your opinion on this question and also perhaps your thoughts on whether uh, the sensor data gathered at the edge of the network uh, can be aggregated some way to reduce the amount of congestion that might be generated from that data? Okay. So the, uh, as the, uh, Wayne said, there is a, in the uh, current uh, mobile networks, there is a huge gap between the uh, demand and the revenue streams. But the, uh, uh, when we start using the sensors for our business models, the manufacturers can be become not only the shipping the box to the customers, they are selling the services to the customers to getting the uh, state of the, uh, uh, the equipment to maintain better uh, support for the customers. So it means the, uh, the organizations, the firms using the network is also providing the services. It means uh, they can cover the cost of the network by their services. So. In my opinion, the gap between the demand and the revenue stream can be become smaller than the uh, current situations. And talking about the uh, uh, where data should be stored in the data center or the edge, the uh, my opinion is the uh, data should be in the edge as well, because of the uh, uh, to reduce amount of the data to transfer to the data center, we have to put some filters or decision logic into the devices. But the uh, best algorithm can be changed time by time. So we need to the actual data intact at the original source. So the uh, uh, M2M network should be edge-heavy architectures. This is my, my opinion. So it seems that nobody can really own the whole infrastructure and application space for, for this new information economy. So how do you see uh, the partnership, the ecosystem evolving to create an open uh, architecture, open environment so that many players can work together to create these solutions? It's a question to me? For, yes, for you. Okay. So the, uh, I think this is a very early stage. So many companies is, in, is uh, it's supporting the possibility of getting the services to uh, providing to the customers. And the, uh, as Wayne said, um, if there is a uh, single platform supporting these services, we have more opportunities to make more valuable services. So I think the, uh, the next stage of exploring the M2M services should be a single platform supporting the multiple services to converging each other to make money more okay. do, you have, do you have uh, thoughts on this too, Wayne? What's that? Do you have thoughts on this too, how to, how to create an open... Yeah, I mean, the, the fact is, where we sit today, um, you know, the ecosystem is, is very fragmented, right? This is complex stuff, and that was kind of my first slide. So what we're focused on is how do we, whether it's a business application or a consumer application, partner with folks to bring a holistic turnkey solution to that problem or to that industry. And the best example I can provide, and we just won um, an innovation award uh, last night and in Detroit, I was able to stay home and come here as opposed to go to the Detroit Telematics show in Novi, Michigan, which is a wonderful place to be, uh, particularly around the automobile space. But our Sprint Velocity platform is a turnkey solution where we're providing the entire stack of the value chain um, to the automobile manufacturing space. So folks that are building connected vehicles from the ground up from a manufacturing space um, 
um, can turn to Sprint and we can provide everything, the software delivery platform, the application storefront, the applications that go in the storefront, uh, the connected device in the vehicle, we can parse the telematics information, which is what the OEM wants to do to, to do service and repair and maintenance and warranty. We also provide on-the-fly applications for infotainment in the vehicle with things like Wi-Fi on the fly. Think of, you know, go-go for the vehicle type thing. So being able to offer those applications, both infotainment and, um, and telematics data that the auto OEM wants to provide um, is, is part of what we do with Sprint Velocity. So that's one particular vertical where Sprint is actually providing way more than just the network. I mean, I'd like to say the network is the most important thing because that is our bread and butter. But in the connected vehicle space, that's maybe 15% of the entire revenue stream and, and frankly functionality and capability that you need to deliver to deliver a connected vehicle application and in the case of Sprint Velocity we're, we were the first carrier to launch an end-to-end -end solution for that market and I see you I think that you'll see and of course we have tier two and tier three vendors downstream but as a master what we call mobile integrator for that industry that's what we're doing um, and I think that you'll see uh, more and more folks start to consolidate so that you can bring those end-to-end -end solutions to a particular vertical um, as, as part of the delivery mechanism for machine to machine. Um, a good question for you, Tom. Um, it's, it, it's maybe a little um, disconcerting to the consumers uh, to think about big companies like yours or Fujitsu or Verizon uh, it's kind of, you know, inhaling all of our personal data into these big, you know, citywide systems or, you know, uh, very large systems where more and more of our information, it, it seems to be owned by the service providers. Can you comment on, on that? Well, uh, yeah, we take, we take a pretty clear position. Uh, uh, personal data, data that, that you generate or your personal usage of resources uh, generates should be your data uh, to uh, release as you see fit, right? And and uh, you know we're we're dedicated to that as part of our AIP program to make sure that that the users um, uh, of the platform, the end users of the platform, can trust that when they say I wish to share or I don't wish to share this particular set of data that that is going to be enforced up, up and down the stream. Um, right now, it's kind of the Wild West. I mean, people, uh, people are, are taking our data and using it to make tons of money, right? And, and we don't, you know, we, uh, I, I guess I have to look at my 20-something my, my sons. They, they live in a world that I don't live in. I, I worry about people taking my data. They don't worry about it. And I'm, you know, so this, 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 um, uh, this philosophy that we have where that that I just espoused that says you own your own data and it's up to you to release it uh, maybe is a you know I'm, I'm, I'm arguing against myself but maybe it's a dinosaur of a philosophy I hope not because I look at my 20 something sons and they're just releasing tons of data about themselves without even questioning what's happening. I would just add on, they're doing it proactively. There right. is a little cultural thing here, right? So again, as a, as a carrier, you know, we have customer proprietary network information and all kinds of security mechanisms and, and, and you know, the protection of that data, you know, is taken very, very seriously. Um, you know, that being said, we also think that there are things like opt-in strategies for marketing programs, things like that. So if customers are provided a benefit, they'll probably release that data, and that's the category, that's the demographic that we sit in. However, if you take a look at the next generation of car buyers, the next generation of smartphones, um, they live in a world that, um, that, that's always had internet. They don't know a world that doesn't have the internet, and they're glad to tell you that I'm at Starbucks now, and I'm going here, and now I'm here, and I mean, they're, they're tweeting, and they're, they're Facebooking, and they're telling the whole world everything that they're doing, right? So that's almost, like I said, it's a cultural thing. So I think what you need to do is make sure that all the things that we roll out have all the lockdown mechanisms available to protect the data, but it is that consumer's data that they can choose to share or not share via opting in or just providing information, right? right? I think it's incumbent on whatever the application provider is to be, um, you know, to, to make sure that, uh, that they are transparent 
and, and what it is, whatever service they're providing. Um, but, you know, if you've ever gone onto any website and, you know, purchased anything, you'll get that big, long legal document that you say, I agree, and you move on. I mean, I was at a conference last week where somebody said, you know, who in here has an iPhone? Everybody raised their hand and said, who read the instruction for the iPhone? <laughs> Right, nobody. They're, they they don't come with any instructions, right? So that's that generation that I think, again, the protection of data is extremely important, will always will be. Um, um, but I think um, it is the customer's data, and they are going to choose who they expose it to going forward. Right. And, and I, was, I was going to, uh, you know, I was going to say beyond the basic data, whether you're measuring, you know, the kilowatt hours on the side of your house or your usage of your vehicle or, or just the, your, your geolocation data out of your cell phone. Beyond that data is actually what, you, what, what gets done with that data in the data economy. That data uh, in and of itself isn't where most of the value lies. Wh where the value lies is when you combine that data with lots of other data to, to, to form much broader sets of, of decisions and services and, and data. Right, and, and that's where I think the dialogue has to be with the end users. How do we participate? You know, we, let's say that we own our own data. Now how do we participate in that economy as the, uh, as the starting point for all of that? And I, I don't think that's been solved either. So. And the adding to the uh, gap between generation gap uh, right. you mentioned, uh, there is a country gap between the uh, European company, countries and the uh, US and Japan. The European companies are very sensitive about the private data. They, are, they have a very strict restrictions. They can't bring their data out of countries. But the uh, US is more, uh, the balance is more like a benefit. If it, right. it can give you the bar good values, it is okay to use the private data. And the Japan is in between. So there is a lot of difference between the countries. I agree. We, we see that in our own research, right? Okay. <laughs> Um, at this point, I'd like to invite the audience to ask some questions. We have one over here. Are, are there mics? Is there's somebody over here asking a question? Stand up, please. Um, so I would like to extend the question that we just discussed about privacy. Um, you mentioned that it's a cultural thing that young people are often more inclined to uh, publish their private information on the internet anyways, and that even if they don't like, the customer has control over the data. But what happens in the application, Tom, that you showed on the video with the flowers and the energy consumption in the company, where the customer is not the user, so the, cu the customer would be the company, and I use this and I can compare my energy consumption with my colleagues. And for example, you could infer that every day from 11 to 1 o'clock my computer is idle mode, so maybe I'm just slacking off and I'll get fired for that. <laughs> so is that a concern that you're addressing in your, uh, in your product or in, is that some consideration you're, you're concerned with? Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a really interesting point. The, uh, uh, to be, to be Honest, we didn't address that in this set of research. The customer, the paying customer, is is the corporate customer, the person, you know, the the entity that is putting in a an energy management system that includes the the IT workforce, uh, is the paying customer. The uh, at least at Intel, whenever we put systems like this in, you can opt, you can always opt in or opt out. I mean, we've been doing little on-screen widgets for various things for years, and you can, you can opt out if you don't want to do it, right? So it would be very hard, I think, under labor laws in any state or country to, uh, uh, to use that data uh, against someone, right? Uh, but in that particular POEM system, uh, we, you know, we viewed it as a partnership between the ultimate end user, the, the, the office worker, and the paying user, the, the corporate energy manager, um, and, and we did quite a bit of uh, interaction research, uh, 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 user experience research, before we did the deployments in Japan and France, and, and that actually led us to, uh, to how we discussed it with the users, 
a lot of questions were asked, including, including some of the, you know, not exactly the question you asked, certainly around that area. And, uh, and it, it was made an opt-in system like, like every other you know, on-screen widget. So. There's a question up here in the front. Stand up, please. Hi, Phil Keyes with Mido Media. Um, I'm seeing a lot of interesting open source, open hardware projects coming around, around sensors, um, Arduino, and also open platforms for taking that sensor data. I'd just like to get some comments from people about how you see that affecting this area. I, I personally think it's wonderful that, that there's innovation going on in, you know, not only the, the edge that we think about, which are the aggregators that can do some computing, but the edge that, that we haven't thought about before, you know, at least at Intel, and that edge are, are the moats, the, the, uh, the really low-end sensors. And I, I see just tons of, you know, tons of work that is you know, so inspiring because it's coming out of folks who are not the traditional um, uh, developers of these things. You know, we used to work you know, back when moats were exciting, uh, you know, we worked a lot with with uh, uh, with Berkeley and others on 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 various projects, and and now we've come full circle to you know to the next generation of folks using open source uh, available low cost hardware um, and programming tools um, to do amazing things, and so I th I think it's all great. It's great innovation. Yes, in the back, please stand up. Getting the hook. Getting the hook. Hi, I'm uh, Rajiv Mehta with Unfrazzle. I was um, very interested with Teresa, your opening remarks, because even though we're talking about sensors, you pointed out that it's not just widgets, it's, it's our own texts and emails. Yes. And so I was wondering how you broaden this definition of sensing in uh, that, you know, we might make a prediction that a person wants to go see a movie because they've been browsing Rotten Tomatoes, but you're prediction confidence is probably much higher if you just see their text that says to their friend, let's go to the movies. Mm -hmm. So how do we broaden this sense of sensing? Uh, d depending on the uh, situation, um, the particular service that you're building, you can sometimes easily pull these different sources of information together. So for example, we built a, um, a leisure time, leisure activity recommendation system for a customer in Japan about six years ago. This was before smartphones. Um, and uh, we were able to uh, read the text messages, for example, while people were, were discussing what kind of activities they wanted to do with, each, with their friends. And then we could use that as long, as, along with other things like location, time of day, uh, their past behavior, a, a lot of other indicators that we had about what they might want to do uh, to offer them suggestions. And we, could, we were uh, attempting to predict the activity that they were going to do, like was it going out to dinner, was it going to a movie, was it going to a museum, things like that, a sporting event, and then within that category, what particular thing uh, they might want to do, like what particular restaurant, what particular bookstore, and, and so forth. And uh, knowing where they were, you know, there's a lot of pieces of context that, that you can pull together. Um, in an enterprise setting, where more commonly uh, we do work with customers, um, there's also the opportunity to um, unify communications from multiple sources, uh, the you know, corporate email, uh, other email, text messages, phone calls, uh, Facebook messages, Twitter messages, and pull them in along with documents, web pages, and so forth that you're consuming. It's a little more complex uh, to instrument all of those sources, um, but they can really add to a more complete understanding of, of uh, what the user's needs are. And we've even explored, although haven't yet implemented, how to build interfaces into other um, I information systems in the company, for example, Salesforce or um, uh, the repair maintenance databases so you can see whether customers you're about to call on in a sales call are having problems with the equipment that they've already purchased from you and that kind of thing. So, so uh, I think there's lots of possibility to use these other sources. It's not just about um, location sensing or um, you know, who, what else is in your environment. It's also about the information. Any other questions out there? I saw some other hands. 
think we're getting the hook. I think we. Oh, we're in the red. Sorry. I think we. Yes. We've run uh, run over time, but uh, Teresa and to our esteemed panelists, thank you very much for uh, for an invigorating discussion.